Welcome, friends, to the History Obscura Reading Room. Thank you for joining me tonight. I can see a little glimpse of the sky out past these ancient, rippled windows, and the night is exceptionally clear. Fancy a little stargazing? Once upon a time, with homemade electronic equipment, Two young Italians kept tabs on Russian satellites and made some startling discoveries. According to their research, they claimed an eerie possibility that a long-dead Russian astronaut was hurtling silently through space at thousands of miles an hour, the victim of a Soviet space shot that went wrong. His body perfectly preserved by intense cold he may be a lonely wanderer in space for centuries to come. Evidence that such a macabre voyager may exist came from an exciting new band of hobbyists, amateur space watchers. Like the early ham radio operators, these talented enthusiasts built their own equipment, often creating for a hundred dollars out of such cast-off junk as chicken wire, used pipe, second-hand radios, instruments that would cost a government hundreds of thousands. Their eavesdropping on astronauts and their satellite tracking achievements were impressive even to professionals. Of the many amateur tracking stations scattered over Earth during the early stages of the space race, one of the most striking and complete was located in the peaceful little village of San Maurizio Canavese, 12 miles outside Turin, Italy. Although much of the equipment was either homemade or dated back to World War II, it looked thoroughly efficient. Inexpensive kitchen clocks on the wall gave Greenwich Mean Time, local time in Moscow, Cape Kennedy, and Turin. Operators wore white lab coats. The tracking console faithfully copied the one at Cape Kennedy in the United States, ingeniously modeled after photographs and scaled down to one-fifth size. The builders of this remarkable station were two brothers, Achil and Gian Battista Giudico Cordiglia. They got interested in radio as a hobby in 1949 while living at Erba near Lake Como. Achille was 16, Jean only 10. When they tried to wheedle funds from their physician father to build a shortwave station, he reacted as most fathers would, saying, Don't waste time when you should be studying. They had better luck with their mother. The U.S. military was then selling off surplus radio equipment at the knockdown price of 5 cents a pound. The boys bought 300 pounds. After rebuilding it to their own needs, they were soon conversing in code with newfound friends the world over. In 1959, the family moved to Turin. Satellite launchings had begun, and the boys were fascinated. There was a whole new world out there, said Jean, and we wanted to be a part of it they decided to concentrate on Soviet rather than U.S. space efforts because Russia was closer and because the Russians were secretive, never publicizing shots in full technical detail as the United States did. They installed crude listening equipment in an old World War II German bunker and shivered through the winter of 1960-61 to while they perfected their apparatus. Achille spared all the time he could from medical school. Jean signed up for a correspondence course in engineering so he could study at the station with his headphones on. Better quarters came the next year when their father took over a convalescent home in a rambling 16th century villa at San Maurizio Canavese. The boys christened their station Torre Bert. Torre for tower? Bert for Via Berta la Zona, the original name of the convalescent home. They already had a number of striking achievements to their credit. 
They could listen to conversations between astronauts and ground stations for a few fleeting seconds as the space vehicles passed over Turin. But they wanted to listen longer and to be able to track satellites. This meant they must have a movable dish antenna, which could follow objects across the sky and scoop up even the faintest electronic signals from space. Governments spend millions for such things installed in elaborate layouts. Britain spent four and a half million at Jodrell Bank, the US Air Force 15 million at Tingsboro, Massachusetts. A Turin contractor offered to build a dish antenna for $3,200. The boys checked their Torre Bert bank balance and found $30. The only solution, of course, was the one they had become accustomed to building their own. From junkyards, they came back with pipe for the antenna framework, an auto steering wheel that could be used to turn it, and truck bearings to carry the ton and a half contrivance. With extraordinary ingenuity, they built other equipment, such as a 4x12 screen that would light up to show the position of a satellite at any given moment, a second screen to follow moonshots, a listening console with three second-hand recorders to take messages from satellites, and in some, it was a remarkably faithful model of the tracking control room at Cape Kennedy. Lacking a library or funds to buy technical journals, the young space watchers had to invent much equipment already in existence, but about which they knew nothing. One example was a filtering device to screen out unwanted noises coming in from space. They also developed methods of determining whether a signal came from the ground or from a moving vehicle. But one of their biggest achievements, which required superb detective work, was determining the frequencies of at least six Russian tracking stations. As their station grew in complexity, it became clear to Jean and Achille that help would be needed for its operation. Fifteen space enthusiasts, mostly in their early twenties, were recruited. The boy's sister, Maria Teresa, got one of the most difficult assignments. She was to learn Russian so that she could translate messages from manned Soviet flights. She became fluent in the language. Next, the boys wanted to organize electronic coverage of the entire Earth. Jean's fiance, Laura Ferbato, was given the job of enlisting other amateur space watchers scattered around the world, from Tahiti in the Pacific, to Angola in Africa, to Argentina in South America. Thus, the 17-station Zeus Amateur Network was born, hooked together by shortwave radio. When the operators of the little Italian station discovered that the Russians were going through a pre-launch rehearsal, they alerted the other Zeus stations so that they could be ready to start tracking when the time came. Normally on a 12-hour schedule, Torre Bert would go on a 24-hour alert when Soviet ground stations became active. Every team member had their assigned post. Two people monitored voices and signals and made tape recordings, two worked the dish antenna, and one of the most talented members of the team, a math wizard, operated a hand-cranked calculating machine to figure speed and orbital path. The team's accuracy was such that they were able to predict, 12 hours in advance, that Russia's Lunik 4 spacecraft would miss the moon by 5,000 miles. The actual miss was calculated at 5,281 miles. Most famously, perhaps, Torre Bert plucked some remarkable messages from space. On November 28, 1960, there was a cryptic message. SOS to the entire world. It came from a moving space vehicle and was repeated three times. Amateurs in Texas and Germany picked up the same message. Three days later, Russia admitted a launch which had ended in failure, but did not mention a man aboard. On May 17, 1961, 
the voices of two men and a woman were heard in desperate conversation. Conditions growing worse, why don't you answer? they said. We're going slower, the world will never know about us. Then silence. The same words were picked up in Alaska and Sweden. Perhaps the most moving message of all was a wordless one, made in early February of 1961. Recorded on tape was the racing beat of an overexerted heart and sounds of labored breathing. The Judica Cordiglia brothers took the tapes to famed heart surgeon Dr. A. M. Dogliati. His verdict was, this is the heart of a dying man. The brothers were firmly convinced that the Russians spent freely of human life to achieve their space successes. Accumulated evidence indicates that there may have been at least 10 deaths. The Judica Cordelia brothers released nine recordings over the span of four years. One of those you heard before I began to tell you their tale. Here I leave you with one more. May it echo in your mind every time you look up at the night sky. Good night. Thank you.